Welcome to the Nature Journal Club, everybody. Uh, how many people were here for last month's class where we did the graded wash and the flat wash? Right. Those two techniques are the essential foundation of old watercolor stuff. Um, and I'm going to, I don't have, I wasn't able to, to get that videotaped, but I'm going to try to sort of sit in front of my, my wall and do that for you. Um, but, but the idea of this class is to extend the bag of tricks of things that you can do with watercolor. And um, in addition to those, 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 the graded wash and the flat wash, um, there are fundamental techniques that if you have them in your bag of tricks, getting textures and all sorts of different effects becomes much easier. The secret behind all of this is water control. That is understanding how much water is on your paper, how much water is in your brush, how much paint is in your brush. And the best way to get that is just by taking a week and playing with your watercolors again and again and again and again and again. Doing these exercises that we're going to be doing, making flat washes, graded washes, again and again and again. And you'll develop an intuitive sense for what these things do and how they do it, why they do it, when they do it. Otherwise, when you start messing around with watercolor, you're like, I didn't expect it to do that. Oh no, like, I hate watercolor, right? They will do these unexpected things. But if you know these fundamental techniques and you just take about one week to intensively practice them, this will be your bag of tricks. Um, this is, today's um, itinerary is going to look something like this. Um, we're going to be looking at these different approaches that have to do with how much of how much water is where. That's the wet and wet, the back runs, and the dry brush. We're going to be looking at the order of operations of on your watercolor page. What do you do first, second, third, fourth, and why that is. Um, and then, generally speaking, it's difficult to get things lighter on your watercolor. It always can go darker by adding more paint. But when you want to go lighter, how do you do that? What does that look like? And so um, we will um, take a look at a bag of tricks for that. Again, the essential thing is not just to watch this video or to listen to this lecture, but to give yourself one week of playing dangerously with these techniques. And you do it again and again and again. And then you will develop an intuitive sense for, I want it to look like this. I want it to be this value, this color, that will come. All right? So we're going to start with these two ideas together, the idea of a wet in wet watercolor and, and the idea of a back run. Um, this is initially going to be, we'll be looking at what kind of edge effects can you get with your brush strokes. And if you put your brush stroke down on paper that's dry, you get crisp, hard edges. If the paper is a little bit damp, it's a soft edge. If the paper is wet, you get very faded edges on your strokes. Paint likes to go where the water is. So the wetter it is, the more movement there's going to be. Drier paper, there's going to be less movement. And so, yeah, absolutely, no problem. So the, the, the first thing that we're going to do is, could I borrow your... Yes. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Or your, or your gear. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Um, so the, the, the first thing that we're going to be doing is take a, a, a brush and you're going to make a few little areas of just damp paper. One, you want to be pretty wet. Another one, just a little bit damp so you can barely see any sheen on it. Another one, there's a very interesting point as watercolor paper starts to dry where the sheen just goes off the paper. Um, but when you look at it from an angle, you can still see there's a slightly different um, texture going on there. You're going to get so areas of different amounts of water on your page. And then, you're going to take a brush, load it up with paint, and stroke through one of those. 
And then you're going to look at, when I do that, how much does that paint move? With that level of dryness, how far does that paint move? With this next level of dryness, what does that look like? Um, and so try, in these different areas, seeing when you make a mark, how much with that, so what you're going to try to do is get yourself to pay really deliberate attention to how much spread you get with different levels of water on the page. And the last one is also going to be kind of fun. They'll be just give yourself an area of, of your paper where you have it damp at the bottom and just make a wash that comes down and the top of your wash kisses into that area that's damp. So, and just see if you can get it to make a hard wash coming down with just a soft edge because you've just lightly pre-wetted that area. So see what that's like. We're going to do a little bit of experimenting now to see how your paint will react on these different wet surfaces. So if you are watching on the video at home, pause it here and do this as a little study at your own table. Get out your watercolors, get out your, your, your paint, give yourself some areas of different levels of dampness, and let's see what happens. Now we're going to build on that. Um, have you ever gotten an effect like this accidentally in your watercolor? Well, something sort of starts happening, you get this sort of weird pale area, it gets a little dark line, a little ridge around the edge of it. Um, if you're adding one color into another color, you're going to get one of two effects. If you have a brush with a heavier concentration of, of, uh, of, of paint, then what is on the page here, as that brush comes into damp paper with paint already on it, you'll get these sort of nice little soft edges. So here I painted green, then mixed up on my brush a little bit of, 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 of paint, but I had it as a thicker consistency to the paint than I had in that little green swatch. Then as I go tap, tap, tap in here, it's going to bleed out giving me a soft edge. This is the wet in wet effect. But here's what confuses people. Here's where, where people kind of run into trouble with this. If my brush actually has a more watery mixture than what is on my page here, so if I have a brush and it's got like a big drip and it kind of comes in, that drip, imagine it landing here on my page, that water wants to go from this area of higher concentration out into the rest of the paper. And as it does, it starts to spread, it can lift up little pieces of the pigment that is in this green area and carry them in a wall in front of it. If you've ever seen one of those um, videos of a tsunami, uh, the, the front edge of the tsunami, it's not a clean breaker of water. It's carrying all the fence posts, posts and all the junk, all the stuff that has been kind of, that it's already encountered in this wall of debris in the front of the tsunami. So this is the same thing happening. I put my water on here. The little tsunami will start to spread here, pushing in front of it this wall of particles of my watercolor paint. That's what's called a background. So this is going to happen when the brush coming in is more watery. This is going to come, give, I'm going to get these softer edges when the paint that comes in on top of, of, uh, of other paint is in a thicker concentration. So these are the two effects that you'll see. Either kind of a soft or feathered edge or the back run effect. So this came in more watery, this was put on this, with this a heavier concentration than that. On your piece of paper, see if you can make a back run happen. Right? Try to make a back run happen. So put down some paint, 
and then get your brush with a little bit more watery paint in it and put that in there and see if you can get that push. Um, some colors that are very staining like phthalo blue, you're not going to get um, much of an effect with this. The more kind of granulating the, the color is, that is the more those little particles that sit on the surface of the paper, the, the better that's going to happen. So perhaps one of your, you know, a burnt umber or something like that, you might be able to get a good effect like that. Where you really have a lot of particles that you can push around. Give that a try. And also, on an area that you've painted, mix up a heavier concentration of paint. See what happens when you put that in there. You'll see that it doesn't do this back run effect. It actually is going to seep in smoothly, slowly, with it giving you a soft edge. The wetter the paper, the softer the edge. Let's avoid big puddles as you're doing this. But start to just play with this. Can you get yourself to add paint to other kind of paint? Or are you going wet into wet, coming in with a greater concentration of stuff, getting one of these blends? Or what happens when you intentionally come in with more liquidy, watery paint on the tip of your brush? Can you make a back run happen? Give that a chance. Let's play with it now. So let's take a look at what you can do intentionally bringing these sorts of effects together. Um, here, you see there's green forest in the back, and then there's this soft edge. So what I was doing is I was painting, I painted in this light green part at the bottom, and then mixed up, was this paint that I brought in a denser uh, concentration of paint or more watery? Denser. Denser. So came in here with this dense dark green, and as I'm blotting that, I'm getting these little soft edges. I don't know if you can see, there's actually a little bit of a background in here that was just some of this green with more water on my brush, I made a little tree shape. It gives you a little bit of a, a little tree shape happening in there. But these sort of softer edge things, I'm coming in on damp paper, but there's more of a concentration of the paint on my brush tip. So I'm getting these sort of soft fuzzball outs instead of a little background. So again, the, the back runs, when people don't expect it, they're going, ah, no, 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 stop, 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 right? You don't know what's going on. But you can predict when the back run is going to happen. You've got some paint down, you're going to come in, it's damp paper, I'm coming in with this really wet, soggy brush, I'm going to make this blob of water, and it's going to want to go, out. The more sort of granulating pigment that I have on the surface of my paper, the more that that's going to move in those little lines. other end of the spectrum here is the dry brush technique. And I'm going to show you two ways, there's two different things that people call dry brush. And I'm going to show you both of these techniques. And these are fantastic for adding texture into your drawings. The danger is that they're really fun to do. And so when people first learn how to do dry brush, they put dry brush everywhere all over their picture. And you can yeah, you don't want to do that. Um, so, two things are going to um, help you handle that. Um, you are going to, in this next week, again, you're going to be experimenting with all these techniques, you'll get a better facility with how to do the dry brush techniques. So when you want to make it work, it'll work for you. But also, by just doing a whole bunch of exercises in your sketchbook, you're going to kind of get it out of your system a little bit. So when you first again start messing with dry brush, you'll be like, hey. <laughs> right? Um, and so we, we want to kind of have some restraint with that. So here is um, dry brush technique number one. What it is, is the paper that I'm using here has texture to it. So there are peaks and valleys. So if I imagine a side view of that piece of paper, there would be little places where the paper sticks up higher, and then there are little valleys between them. This would be perhaps rough watercolor paper, where some watercolor papers actually have a texture imprinted in them. And then, if I take a brush, and instead of taking the point and pressing it down into it, which you fill all these spaces, instead, you take the side of the brush and you drag it across the top of these. It leaves behind, on the tops of these peaks, 
little bits of paint, and on the valleys, they don't get, um, the, the, the paint doesn't reach those little valleys. So this kind of sunlight on water texture or white caps on the ocean texture that we're getting up here, this is also the thing of this as tree bark. This is just made by taking a brush and glancing the side of it over textured paper. And I'll demonstrate this in a moment. The second technique for dry brush is going to involve taking your brush tip, mixing up some, a paint solution that is not really watery. I want it to be fairly, fairly thick, not gunky gloppy, but fairly thick, so that I can fan and spread the tip of my brush. And when I do that, one stroke of that will make, with these multiple tips here, these sort of multiple hair-like marks. Let me expand this so you can sort of see what that texture looks like. So this, all these things going out here, that was one stroke that did all these, one stroke that did all these. And so your brush will be able to give you this, this can be as part of grass texture, fur texture, feathers on the breast of a bird. Um, with a larger brush, I can get um, effects, these sort of, lines coming down here in these, these hillsides. I had a brush that was kind of fanned so that with one mark I could kind of get a bunch of these and could very quickly get this texture over this foreground. Um, here's doing the same thing on a smaller scale. You can see dry brush texture in here. Look at the bottom edge of this grass. It looks grassy. That's not me going ee, 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 ee. That's a few little kind of quick lines doing that. And that gives you this, this what's called the dry brush texture. Um, so now what I'd like to do is just to do a little demo of what this could look like. Could I borrow? Mm -hmm. Once again, thank you very much for letting me use this. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that this, um, you can see this here. Um, I have a little card that has texture on it. And what I'm going to do is take my brush tip, and this is, if I go like this, and I get a big mat of water, that's going to be, means my brush is a little bit too wet. I'm going to, thank you. What I want to do is just have this, what I want to do is just have this glance across the top of the paper. I can't see that in the screen. You can't see. Higher the up a little. Well, in, the, in, the, in your videos. Oh, you can't see in the in the camera. Yeah. In the Are camera. we in the camera? Sorry. Yeah. yeah now I can see it. All right. Does that what what, what, I, what I'm what I'm wanting to do? Is let's try it here. Are we in the screen? Yes. All right. So as I do this, there are these little marks that we've got these little speckles left behind in some of those valleys. And that, again, can be sunlight on water, tree bark, all sorts of things. But I'm intentionally letting the brush, the side of the brush, if I go with the tip of the brush, it's a little bit more, the tip wants to push into all the valleys. The side of the brush can skip across the surface a little bit more. All right. So give that a try. Get some textured paper and try skipping with the side of that brush across and seeing if you can get that kind of a texture. For the, the second dry brush effect, I don't want my brush tip to be really wet and soggy. I want it to be a fairly thick, uh, a fairly thick paint. And what I want to do, is so actually let me use a, a large size water brush if I could. That's, I think that's uh, the medium. It's a little bit. All right. All right. So I've got some paint on the tip of my brush. I'm going to hold it at the bottom and fan that so that it makes multiple tips. If my paint is too wet, the surface tension of 
the water will hold the tip together. All right, um, so I want it to be a little bit gummy, my paint, just a little bit, not too watery. And then the secret is I'm going to just as lightly as I can tickle the surface of the paper with the tip of that brush and just lightly tickle the paper. If I press hard, then I'm combining all my little points and flattening the thing out and going all the way and, and I'm losing my sort of uh, texture effect. But with multiple points, I get that second dry brush effect. Let's give that a try now, both those techniques. So the side of the brush and the, the, uh, the fan brush tip. The next general idea that we're going to explore is the timing of things. It turns out with watercolor, there's an order of operations. Things, things that you can do first or second. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule, but generally speaking, there's a couple, there are two kind of guidelines that if you keep those in mind and follow them, you will avoid a lot of the problems and that, that people often encounter when they are, are working with, with watercolor. So the first general principle is that at the start of your painting, you are going to, you're going to move from the lightest areas towards darker and darker and darker paint. So you start with your lightest stuff and you move darker and darker. As a matter of fact, the first step is to figure out what are the parts of your painting that you want to leave completely white? Decide that at the start, and then you're not going to touch those areas. So you have to leave those whites. But then, the next, the most sort of pale values, you're going to put in the pale ones first, then the middle values, and then at the end of the painting, you're going to be putting in your dark values. With watercolor, you can always go darker but it's hard to go lighter. We'll look at some ways that you can go lighter, but it's going to be more difficult. Um, so generally speaking, there's this progression of from light to dark. The one exception to that is that sometimes when people do this, you finish your entire painting and you look at it, and the whole thing is way too pale. That You sort of have this kind of weak, anemic watercolor. You didn't go the full range of the values. If this happens to you, it is probably one of two reasons. One may be that if you have a really inexpensive set of watercolors, very often most of the paints in those don't allow you to go really dark. You can't get there from here. Um, so it's not you, it's the paints that you're using. Um, so see with your paints, without kind of turning it into a thick paste, how dark does it really go? And if you find you are only getting middle values and you're not able to go to dark, 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 without sort of turning it into putty, um, you might want to upgrade your watercolors. And for folks watching at home, if um, you are trying to put your watercolor kits together and you find that you cannot afford this at this time, um, there are some people who have made some donations to me of some supplies. And um, through their generosity, we can hook you up with materials that you need. So send me a private email, and um, if supplies are still available, I can hook you up. Um, then that's true for all sorts of art supplies, from sketchbooks to pencils to all those sorts of things. If those are still in stock, um, I can help you out there. So generally, starting from light to dark is going to be good, but sometimes the whole thing ends up too pale. So a great way to handle that is if there's some part of your drawing that is going to be really dark and it's off on the side somewhere, put that in early on as kind of a dark anchor. Mm -hmm. And then what it's going to do, it's going to force you to go to that full value range. You're just reminding yourself, it's a physical reminder on the page, when we're talking dark, that's the point that we're talking to. So generally speaking, working light to dark, but sometimes it's helpful to early on have a dark anchor in some place that, you know, where you're not going to need to wash over it with other 
um, washes and things where you're not going to have to worry about detail. Someplace just to force you to go the full range. Right? So, light to dark is idea number one. The second idea is it's useful to start with broader, large areas that you can cover in a few strokes and then work your way towards detail at the end. Um, so very often I'll put shadows in early on that I'll just sort of on a, on, a, on a bird or a flower, I'll look at where do the shadows fall and I might even put those in as my first layer. Let that dry and um, then I can work over that with su successive layers. If there are big areas of orange, if I'm drawing say a tiger lily, there are those little spots and then there are the big orange areas. If you put those little spots in first, then when you're putting the big orange areas in, the orange is going to mess up those spots. But instead, you put in all the orange areas, you let that dry, now you can put in these little deliberate spots wherever you want, and it will stay crisp and clean. So that's working from both light to dark, and working from larger areas moving into detail. This bird, is going to help us take a look at that. Um, I'm going to do a, a monochromatic study of this bird. A monochromatic study is a study just using one color. So not all the colors in your palette. You pick one that can go fairly dark and you do the whole thing with it. This is a great way to train yourself to really think about lights and darks and values. There's enough on your plate if you're, if you're worrying about, if you're thinking about um, how much, you know, kind of getting a sense for water control without having to worry about which color of orange is this. Sometimes when we get focused on color, we get so into matching color that we totally lose track of value. So at the start, and actually I still do this all the time, I will regularly do just a little value study. I'll be doing a landscape, or if I'm thinking like, oh man, I feel overwhelmed by this subject, how would I even approach this? I'll just say, okay, forget color, I'm just going to look at lights and darks. Um, so I'm going to do a monochromatic study of this bird. Squint your eyes and you can see that the, the orange on the head here is actually really light. It's easiest to see that when you squint your eyes. Not as light as this. So in this, I would first go like, hmm, what are the whites that I'd want to leave? Probably this up here and this here. Maybe some in here. And then what are my, uh, the, the, the next darkest value? Well, I've got this color of the belly here, I've got this. These wings are a little bit um, lighter than this dark back. So I'm kind of looking at where are the darks and where are the lights. And then, I'm going to fill in this bird with it. On my website, johnmuirlaws.com, um, this, this is set up as a step-by-step. -step. You can download this sketch of this bird and follow each of these steps along as individual um, uh, steps that you can do if you want to draw directly over this same drawing. That way you don't have to worry about, I don't want to mess up this drawing. You just print one out and then you're just playing with the watercolor. As a study to see how it works. So where would I start with this? Well, first I'm going to figure out where I'm going to leave my whites. And then I'm going to, in this bird, put in my shadow on my belly. I decided to leave a little edge mm -hmm. of non-shadowed here, kind of as a full reflected light zone. Even if I don't see that in my photograph, often that makes the object look a little bit more round. Mm -hmm. And then my next darkest value is that orange on the face. And I don't have to work around these black spots because it's a lighter thing and there will be darker going on top of that, I can paint that value over the entire face. And I let that dry. And then the next last value, so again, we're working from large areas, lighter working towards darker. So that's the, the big take home from this, is just the order of operations. I'm intentionally now going these zones. So a middle value here in the tail, the wings, the, the, the scapulars up here, and the beak. And the final thing is there are some areas in here that are really dark. And those are the last things that I put in. <clears throat> so 
So is that very clear from larger areas and less detail to towards darker and more detail? The final thing that I do now is I put in a bit of detail. Detail is a spice that you put a little bit in at the end of a drawing. If you put dry brush over the entire bird, you're going to kill the drawing. Um, but a little bit here, especially in the face, where I, I want people to look at this cool bird's face. A little bit of dry brush detail in here. And I put a reflection in the eye with a gel pen. We'll be talking about gel pens in just a second. A little bit of detail in the wing. So here's without the detail, here's with some detail. Just a little bit goes a long way. You don't have to detail the entire thing, but you put it where you want people to look. I could stop here. I chose to put a little bit of background in the, this, and it looks like I just sort of put in some random splotchy, camouflagey, oh, there's foliage back there background. But I'm actually doing something very deliberate here. In places where it's next to a pale part of the bird, notice that this background is dark. In places where the bird is dark, notice that that background is light. So it's light against dark and dark against light. That's going to really help this bird stand out. If I want it to blend in with its environment, then I just do the opposite, light against light and dark against dark. I would just sort of bring dark to dark edges, and then my bird would be hiding. But I really wanted this to pop out. So I just reversed those. And it looks like it's random, but there's, there's a bit of intention behind it. Let's just back up over this one more time and just think about order of operations. Choose where you're going to leave your lights. The pail. We're going to have two stages of middle values, step one, step two, and finally the darkest darks, detail at the end. So when I look at a, a painting, I'm often thinking, how would I approach this? What are my darks? What are my lights? What are my big areas? I'm not starting at a random place. I'm using those as general principles to guide me in how I'm going to move my way through that picture. And you see there, in the eye, I brought a highlight back into the eye. It was an old dark eye, but I put a highlight back in there. So what we're going to talk about now is when you want to make parts of the drawing that you've already made dark lighter. You could have left that as white and worked around it. But sometimes you're like, oh, that's a little bit too dark. What can you do about that? Well, you actually have a bag of tricks. And we're going to take a look at a number of things that you can do to make parts of your drawing lighter again, part of your painting lighter again. And these are the, the techniques we're going to be taking a look at. So gouache and white pencil and pen, we're going to do that at the end. Let's take a look at this idea of lifting out. This is kind of a cool concept. Um, different kinds of paints act in very different ways. So this looks like it's the same color of paint. This is phthalo blue green shade. This is a paint called, um, what is it, a manganese blue hue. And the way that these work is very different. The, the phthalo stains the paper blue. The manganese, it's like little pieces of blue manganese and that's in a solution, and it sloshes out on the top on the paper. Here's my paper, here's my manganese, and they're little pieces of manganese blue. I guess this is no longer technically manganese blue, so maybe it's not made out of manganese. I don't know what manganese blue hue is made out of. But they're little particles that sit on the surface. They're not staining the paper below. Little particles up here. So if I get that paper damp and just go wipe, 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 a couple of little strokes in here, I can lift out that paint that was here. And I can go with the manganese blue hue all the way back to white paper. This was three strokes of a damp brush and tap tap with a clean paper towel. And I got it this pale. This over here on the phthalo blue was about 20 strokes and I started to destroy the surface of the paper and blah blah blah, it's not going anywhere. So, you can't do this with all colors. So some are very staining. 
phthalo blue being a classic stainer. This one, you can lift it out. So you can do all sorts of cool effects with this. Um, I paint an area blue, get some places wet, and tap, tap, tap out with a little paper towel, and I get clouds. So I can pull clouds back out of a blue sky. It's going to be, you'll get different effects on different kinds of paper. And you'll get different effects with different kinds of paint. A lot of really cheap papers, you're not able to do a lot of lifting out. They very quickly will turn back into just wood pulp. Mm -hmm. And so when you keep working at it, you're going to burn a hole all the way through the paper. Um, but with thicker papers, um, often water, things that are designed to take watercolor, you can do a lot of this lifting out. So you've got a lot more flexibility. So what... Um, if I could borrow this again. Um, so what I can do is on a piece of paper, get an area wet, and there is a light area that I made in a dark wash. This was all dry. So I can push back into some of those those, 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 those areas. Um, there's a wonderful book called Letters to a Young Bird Artist. It's a, a record of a really amazing correspondence between the bird artist Louis Agassiz Fuertes and George Sutton, who was a, then a young boy, grew up to become a great bird artist. And um, Sutton was mailing Fuertes paintings that he'd done, and Fuertes would give him feedback and comments on it and send those back. And there's there's one where Fuertes um, had noticed that the, the back of this flycatcher was just sort of a solid mass. And um, wrote to Sutton about kind of the way that sunlight affects something and how even something with a white belly and a dark back in full sunlight, that that dark back can often be lighter than the white belly that's in shadow. And uh, Fuertes took a damp brush and stroked it along the top of the bird and part of its back, lifting out a little of the paint and showed Sutton how that then gives you this more three-dimensional effect as if sunlight is falling on the back of that bird. Mm -hmm. So you can get in there and lift out some colors to put sunlight back in your painting. Mm -hmm. Give that a try now. See how that works on some of the, 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 the pieces of, um, the, some of the washes that are on your pages, um, some of the studies that you've done so far. Let's see if you can get into any of those and lift out some color. Another fun trick that you can use is called using a resist. Um, here I wanted to draw a painting of a, here's a little painting of a, a skyscape. And it's a blue sky, some big puffy white clouds. And I have drawn in some of the shadows under these clouds. And then what I did is I took a piece of white crayon and smeared that over the tops of these clouds, overlapping with some of that purple part. The white crayon puts a layer of wax down on the page, and the watercolor won't stick to it. So when I put a layer of blue over this, where the white crayon has been applied, these little cloud shapes appear. So on this little card right here, I have um, put down some areas of white crayon. And if I hold it at an angle, I can actually see the shine on this of where I have crayon and where I don't. I, so when I look at it straight, I can't see the evidence of my crayon. So I'm just going to grab some of your paint here, if I could. And let's see where the crayon is. Oh, there's crown. There's some more crown. 
I've got a little braided wash down there. You'll notice that there are some little specks of paint over the middle of this cloud. I just get in there and I wipe those off. Those little clouds appear out of the paper. It's unforgiving. Once that wax is down, you're not getting back in there with watercolor. So have fun. you can have a lot of fun with that. Just to show you a few other examples of things that you can do with this approach. So there it is with clouds. Let's take a look at this with grass. Sometimes when I'm drawing grass, there are these sort of clumps of pale grass in the foreground, and I've got darker grass that's behind them behind it. And how do you get these sort of overlapping clumps of grass? Here I've just put down some generic grass shapes. And then I took a white crayon and I drew in another set of grass-like shapes. And on top of that, I can put a layer of darker green. And you see where this crayon is, there are, in those spaces, you know, there's, there's dark grass behind lighter grass. So the reason that this part is turning is yellow is because I first had the yellow green down, then I put the crayon on, so the yellow green was already there. Now the dark on top of that doesn't go where that yellow green is. Pretty sneaky. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll take, let me put in a few just little shapes up here, a few kind of things coming up this way that sort of feel like grass. People look at this and look like, oh, that looks like grass. Therefore, I know exactly what's going on here. And it gives you this sort of sense of the lawn, the deep sort of prairie moment. Um, this is going to be a crashing wave. And I have some of my foamy part here. I'm drawing in some of the shadows on the foamy part of the wave. And then I took a crayon and just in a very irregular way, being regularly irregular, worked around the edges of that shape. And then just took darker paint and painted that until I got to the place where I hit that resist and stopped. See that really irregular edge? And I'm going to darken my shadows in here. There's, there's some crayon irregularly in here. So if I put just a little bit more shadowing in here, I get another layer of darks on top of that. And this little level of irregularity and frothy chaos would be hard to do with deliberate, I'm going to work around this and work around this and work around this. But it was fast with this crayon going <laughs> and it gives you that level of chaos in the picture. Um, let's take a moment. How many people brought a white crayon with them? Got a few white crayons in the room. All right. Um, I also have white crayon to share. You, if you, anybody has a big white crayon, you actually only need a little nugget like this. So if you want to be, you can be a, a white crayon fairy. Um, but uh, let's, let's uh, see if we can share some of these around and uh, just take a moment and play with what it's like. Another way of adding, getting your uh, page to be lighter is to put white paint on it. Um, and so here's, here's the wave. I want it, I'm going to make it a little bit more contrasty in the back so that some of this froth shows better. But also, I took some white paint and painted some foam. So this white paint is permanent white gouache. It works just like watercolor. You can have a glob of this stuff, let it dry in your palette. It will tend to want to flake off and chip off more easily. 
Um, so you have to keep re-wetting the bottom and sticking it back on your palette. But um, it is much more useful white. A lot of kits come with something called Chinese white, Chinese white watercolor, and it's very, very transparent. You do not need that. So if you want to keep the white in your palette, get rid of that Chinese white and throw in some permanent white gouache. And you'll find that you can cover things a little bit more easily with those. Um, the, uh, you don't need that Chinese white in your watercolor palette. Um, here's another example. So you can, you know, here it's used intentionally for these foam things. Can you imagine trying to work around those? That would be hard. That would be really hard. Um, or sometimes you just you forget to put in your lights, or if you know you've got gouache, um, you can intentionally use that. Um, so this bird here, my uh, when I use gouache on a on a painting, what I usually do is for all the dark parts, I use watercolor. And I sometimes will carry with me a little palette of gouache but I only have light value paint in it. And then on the bird, I can, if there's a few light things, I can pop those with gouache, but anything that's dark, I'll use the transparent watercolors. So for this guy, I did the same thing, sort of building up first the lighter, and then working darker, then working even darker. But on this, I've left out, there's a bunch of white bars on the wings and edges in here. And I didn't put any of that in on this, this uh, bird back. These, this is actually handled very, very loosely and lightly. And on top of that, I can put in the gouache. Take a look at the texture on this belly. Without the gouache, with the gouache. Mm. Mm. Wow. All right. In here, I'm getting brown edges on these feathers and some white wing bars. When oh. you're using the Pentel brush. That's also with the Pentel brush. Pentel Aquash. Large, fine point brush. My favorite go to brush. Right. And so you can see that gouache in there. So that's just, I want some pale bars in there. I'm sticking them in. Um, but again, you don't need the dark colors with the gouache. Do that with your trans. I find transparent watercolor much easier to handle. You get a bunch of layers of gouache in, on top of each other and they start to want to mix together all the time. You get them a little bit wet, they all reactivate immediately. You can't really glaze layers on very easily. Um, so it's a little bit more of a nuisance to work with. Some people like David Sibley do exquisite stuff with it, but I find it very challenging to work with. Um, so I do most of my stuff with transparent watercolor for my darks, and then I might throw in a little bit of gouache to pop some highlights. And if you're doing stuff on toned paper, gouache is really cool. Um, so all the light colored stuff, these yellows and the whites, that's with gouache. And it really just allows you to pop that. It's fun to be able to go, so to add the white as a positive thing. So gouache is one thing in your, your bag of tricks. Another that's very intuitive, very portable, really easy to use, is just a white colored pencil. So I keep a, uh, either a Prismacolor white colored pencil, or my favorite brand of um, colored pencil right now is the Faber-Castell Polychromos pencils. Really, really sweet, creamy pencils. Uh, you'll like using those a lot. Um, so this is a bird without any, it's, I've got some lights and darks on it. This is all watercolor. I let it dry. It's with, a, with a colored pencil, you let the thing dry. You don't want to put the pencil on top of wet paper. And same picture with texture. No texture here. This might as well be plastic back here. But a few little texture lines, and this thing becomes fluffy on its back. That was colored pencil. And you're just going like this. Yep, a little colored pencil. A few little flicks. And then it reads as being fluffy. And also, is it reading that it's highlighted from the top down? The sun is above? Yes, yep. So when you're putting in that pencil, you're thinking, <coughs> I am the sunlight. Where is the sunlight okay. falling on this? And you're putting in those little flicks 
trying to represent texture and the, the, the fall of the sunlight. Mm -hmm. okay. And that, it's really fun. So in your brain, you are the sunlight. Yeah. So what color, color pencil are you using? Is it a, a copper or a brown? It's not black oh, or oh, gray? Uh, oh, so, so this brown here, this, this stuff here, yeah. uh, that, that is a brown. But brown. all this texture stuff in here, that's a white color pencil. Oh. So I just carry that white colored pencil with me. That's my kind of go-to, I need a little bit of texture on this. And then you put that in. Another very intuitive way, a tool that you can use for adding lights back in is a white gel pen. So gel pens are pens that allow you to draw. Um, it's got a, a sort of a thick, opaque ink. And so if you have a piece of black paper, you could write a letter with it and it would show up. These little white lines in here, those are, I painted the purple petal, uh, sepal here, let that dry, and then drew in those edges, those little lines. And you notice that some in the middle here are yellow. That's not a yellow gel pen. That is, I painted this, drew this with the white gel pen, let that dry, and then mixed up some yellow paint, and you can tint those lines. You come in there at that sharp Pentel Aquash water brush, and you whip, 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 and you get the lines, yellow ones, in the middle of that. <laughs> These little lines here, that's just gel pen coming down. And take a look at these, uh, this sepal here. It has this little purple edge on it. Little purple edge. That was, same, see the same thing here? Yeah. Kind of makes it feel like that edge is turning towards you. Uh -huh. Just a little bit. Um, that little purple edge is taking the gel pen, going along that edge, and then letting it dry, mixing up some light purple, and tinting that line. And that then takes that, that edge and just turns it towards you. So that little bit of edge, catching the light a little bit, but not so harsh that it's like in full sunlight. And if, by the way, I get some gel pen on here and I decide I don't like that, the gel pen is very, very accommodating. If I want to get rid of it, I just get a little bit more water on there, give a few strokes, it'll lift out in time. So if I wanted to get rid of those lines, I could. This one has some subtle gel pen in places like that. Places where I wanted to turn edges towards the viewer. And then do you control uh, the highlighting with the white gel pen by the pressure? The pressure? Uh, it's not really pressure sensitive. Um, okay. So what I do is you can draw that in and then depending on how much you want to tint that. Uh -huh. um, you could put one layer of green over it, maybe two layers of green over it. One caveat about the gel pens, they will dry out more quickly than you want them to. So you'll have a pen, you've used this much of it, you have this much more ink, wow. and you'll start drawing with it and you're getting no more white out of it. Wow. Um, it just seems to be a gel pen thing. So don't buy a whole bunch at one time. Um, because you'll kind of you'll get there and you're like, well, they're gonna dry it. Um, and make sure when you buy them in the art supply store that it still has ink flow, because mm -hmm. they, for some reason, they just they dry up more quickly than any pen, mm -hmm. even when it still has ink inside of it. They just get clogged. Mm -hmm. So a good thing to know. So that is that a bag of tricks for getting things lighter. You can do that when you want to. Um, <laughs> We've taken a look at messing around with water control, the timing of things, and making our, our, our paintings lighter. These combined with those uh, two major techniques from the other workshop, the graded wash and the flat wash, you have really um, a, a, a small set, but a very adaptable set of tools that you can apply for any painting that you're doing. The secret, again, is that you want to get comfortable using these in little studies. If the next time that you have to do dry brush, you draw on a bird and you're thinking about putting some dry brush texture down on its flanks, 
you'll be terrified to give it a try because how is that really going to work? Is it be blotchy? Um, but if you have experimented with these things, just get a sketchbook page. Open your sketchbook up. And you know, you've got a little study here where you did a flat wash, you did a graded wash here, you did a flat wash over that, you did then let that dry, and you did dry brush texture on top of that. You put in a wash here and then um, did a, um, a back run into it. Um, you did wet and wet into this part here. Um, you play with all these sort of things. Get yourself like a bunch of little swatches. Just play with wet and wet. Another really fun thing to do is you just make a zen doodle of some sort. And um, paint this whole thing one color. And then this overlap, you know, glaze it with another. Then do a flat wash across this. Then put, uh, um, you know, work on a back run here and do wet and wet into here. And you can, on a page, really just, you can sit in a cafe, hang out, play with these things, give it one week of just active play. And all these tools, the next time you need them, are going to be right there at your fingertips. And it makes watercolor, you get, watercolor can do these really fluid, surprising, interesting things, which is great when you want it to. Right? And you'll know how it behaves. Yeah. And so then when you want to sort of take advantage of these sort of dynamic effects, you can, because you'll know how to kind of make it go in that direction. And then you just sort of sit back and you look at the happy accidents that watercolor gives you. Or when you want more control, you can use more control. But the secret is to fill up a few sketchbook pages with this kind of a study. Give it one week, one week of just messing with it, messing with it, messing with it, messing with it. And this stuff is yours. So I hope that this helps you with your watercolor play and fun. Have a good time with it, and I'll see you in the field. Okay, thank you. Thank you.